Welcome to PwC IFRS Talks, your source of all things IFRS, technical accounting matters, business issues and regulatory updates. I'm your host Dave Walters. In today's episode we're going to be talking with Catherine Dunkersley uh, from the ISB. Welcome Catherine. Thank you Dave. Uh, would you like to share with us uh, a little bit about what you do at the ISB? Um, I definitely would. Uh, so I have been at the ISB now for almost six years. Um, I'm a member of the technical staff um, and in the time that I've been there I've primarily worked on the leases project and I currently also work on the board's disclosure initiative. So in, in terms of background and relevant to some of the discussions we're having today, I joined the ISB from one of the, the big retailers in the UK where I used to work in the finance team and as part of that role one of the things I did was that I was involved in uh, responding to one of the leases exposure drafts. So I came to the ISB with some um, experience of, of seeing the other side of that um, and then when I got to the organisation I was involved in the decision making that led to the development of the final requirements, writing the standard and then ultimately publishing IFRS 16 back in January 2016. Um, after that I was very involved in the board's implementation support activities. So there's a period of time after the board publishes any new standard where they make a real active effort to undertake activities such as educational materials, conferences where we can go out and speak to stakeholders about implementation all with a view to help in practice get off to a good start if you like with the, the, the new requirements. In more recent years there, there was a period where things were a bit quieter on leases and at that time um, I moved on to work on the board's disclosure initiative which is a whole suite of projects that is all about taking steps to help address what is commonly referred to, to the disclosure problem. So that's um, around things like financial statements um, containing perhaps information that is, is not as relevant as it might be, mm. lacking information that, that is the, the most relevant or the most material, and effective communication of the information that is provided. So it's, it's taking steps to help with those things. More recently, again, still, as leases has kind of come back to the table in terms of the interpretations committee starting to get questions, I'm kind of keeping a, a finger in both of those <laughs> pies. So I've had quite quite a varied role at the organisation. Excellent. So, so, we, so once the standard was published, that's kind of the beginning of, of, the, of the, the phase of implementation, um, rather than just having to sit back and in, in bask in the glory of having got IFRS 16 out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Some people used to refer to, to it as set and forget, but, but the board, the board is, is very cautious of not doing that. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so, so maybe we'll start with your reflections on the fact it has now gone live and we have seen so as the first interim reporters and one or, two, one or two early adopters too. So is what you've seen in line with your expectations? Well, I'm going to start by saying that my answer to this question, and in fact my answer to any question you, you might be about to ask me, is entirely a personal view. Uh, it doesn't reflect the views of the board or the IFRS Foundation, but I would say that the short answer to your question is, is yes. Mm -hmm. What we have seen so far is absolutely in line with expectation, and, and that is in, in many different respects. Of course, financial reporting in the sense of the effect that has been had on the financial statements, including things like the um, effects on equity, on profit ratios and such like. It's been, been very much what the board expected at the time. When we published IFRS 16, as we do with all standards, we um, performed what is called an effects analysis, where we do a lot of research and um, analysis of the impact we expect the standard to have and an assessment of what we think financial statements will look like yeah. after the changes have been implemented and what we are now seeing is, is very much in line with that. Also in a practical sense things are in line with what the board expected. So one example of that is that all the way through the project I think we at the ISB very much felt as we were finalising that what we were doing was expanding the prevalence of a very well understood model, essentially yeah. the finance lease model, and actually the real big challenges for companies were going to be the more practical ones, literally locating their contracts, yes. identifying their contracts, 
setting up a system and getting this huge volume of contracts into that system. We always expected those to, to be the, the biggest challenges for companies in, in implementing the new requirements and based on all the feedback we've heard, that also has, has proven yeah. to be the case. So based on what we know at the moment, I would say um, things are going the, the way that the board had thought at the time. Excellent, that's, that, that's good to hear. Are you hearing of any views on the benefits of the new standard? Oh, well, I love this question. <laughs> I have to say, yes, we are. So I could name a, a few examples of, of things that I've heard there, and I would say they all relate to the sort of old adage of you can't manage what you don't monitor. So the fact that IFRS 16 has led companies to go down what you know we can't deny has been a, a challenging path of implementation with these many thousands of contracts identifying them, getting them into systems has given companies information that has enabled them to do some really beneficial things. So the two most prevalent things I've heard, one example is about visibility of the portfolio overall and helping companies with things like lease buy decisions and just allowing them to do things like that on a more informed basis. But also, and I can honestly say I've heard many examples of this, we've heard about companies that through the, the IFRS 16 implementation process have identified contracts which they are still paying for every month <laughs> but they no longer have the asset in question and haven't had it for quite some time, and they have now been able to you know, yeah. <laughs> end those contracts. So, so those are just, just two examples of, of, of some of the benefits we hear from, from companies implementing the standard. Um, and then the, the other side is, of course, the huge, huge piece that is benefits for investors in terms of information. Mm. It is very early days in that sense because we are still within the first year of mandatory application. So whilst there have been perhaps surprising number of early adopters, more than we've seen with, with other new standards, it is still going to be a, a few months until yeah. all companies are reporting this way. So it's probably a bit early to comment, but anecdotally, the information we, we believe is achieving what was intended which is communicating information about the um, you know the, the lease exposures that are out there and that exist do you have any uh, do you have any observations on some of the transition disclosures that we're already seeing oh uh, well yes <laughs> so in terms of transition disclosure that there's two different ways that companies can can do it and it depends whether they have taken one or more of the, the many practical experience yes. on transition offered in, in the standards. But the great number of companies have decided to take the, the practical experience that are offered, and that means they're not restating their comparatives. And a key piece of the transition disclosure, and certainly the, the piece that we are hearing is, 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 is very, very useful, is that companies are having to effectively explain how they got from operating lease commitments yeah. in the financial statements that were published the day before IFRS 16 was adopted to the lease liabilities that are added to the balance sheet on the first day of the, the period of adoption. And we've actually already seen loads of examples of these and other transition disclosures because companies are in fact putting them in their interim reports. So it's, so it's not only the early adopters we've seen, we, we've also seen a, a good chunk of transition disclosure in those interims. And in terms of transition disclosures, and p particularly the, the one I just described, we have actually seen some, some really um, good disclosure in terms of companies providing good explanations of how they've got from A to B in terms of moving from the old standard to the new. They've you know, provided good disaggregations of what the movements are and we've seen some good, great examples where companies have explained their um, decisions about applying the requirements of IFRS 16 for the different types of asset that they have. So, so in terms of transition disclosures, that there are some, some yeah, some, some good, good, good disclosures out there. Yeah, I guess my observation on that would be that the you know, there are some good examples out there. They take time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's quite a lot of disclosures to give, particularly if you've taken advantage of the transition uh, reliefs that, that are available. So, so don't leave it to the last minute on your you know, on your annual accounts, for example, if you're trying trying to trying to put something more comprehensive in there. So. Uh, so yes, but in, in, in summary, from, the, from your perspective, uh, the 
the new standard implementation is, is achieving what you hoped it would? At the moment, I can say yes to that question. I, 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 of course, you know, you have to caveat because it still is very much early days, and I'm sure in the reporting cycle in March we will see more financial statements yeah. than, 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 than we've got at the moment, but based on everything we hear at the moment, it seems to be achieving what, what had been intended, so yes. <laughs> uh, so outside of the uh, lease project, what else is, uh, what else is keeping you? Keeping you occupied at the moment. You talked about the disclosure project. I did talk about the disclosure project. So within the disclosure project, we we do a number of things. The most um, active project at the moment is our targeted standards level review of disclosures. And essentially, what that project involves is the board exploring ways in which it can do things differently in the way that it develops and drafts disclosure requirements to help um, companies, auditors, regulators, everyone move towards a place where we are getting financial statements that communicate more effectively, that focus on the material, that avoid what we um, typically call a, a checklist um, yeah. compliance type approach. So if I may I use leases as, as an example, because uh, for, for me, I mean, these are my two favourite topics, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to find some linkage. The board has has been thinking for, for, for many years about disclosure. You know, it's a it's a key topic and it's one that, that we hear a lot about from stakeholders and have done for a long time. And over a period of time the board has been thinking and taking steps towards more objectives based disclosure requirements. So using disclosure objectives um, to help companies, auditors, everyone understand why disclosure requirements exist yep. because that will enable them to make more informed decisions about what's material, what to focus on, what can perhaps in their case be omitted because it, it, mm. it, it is immaterial in some cases. Leases was an example of a, of a step along that path. So in the leases standard, the disclosure requirements effectively come in two buckets. So there's a bucket of stuff for which if a company has a material lease portfolio, it needs to disclose all of these things. And it's things like information about lease expenses, lease cash flows, breakdown of, of certain items by class of right of use asset for example and if it if those things are, are, are if a material then they need to be in and companies will disclose a table of, of essentially a list of items and those disclosures were were in the standard and they are prefaced with an entity shall disclose x if, if you see what i mean yeah there's then a whole host of other very interesting lease disclosures about things like variable lease payments and residual value guarantees, extension and termination options, which um, really do require a greater degree of judgment because companies will have really unique entity specific type, type arrangements with regard to these things and what is the most useful disclosure in one case is quite unlikely to be the most useful disclosure in another. So with those um, types of requirements in IFRS 16, the board took much more of an objectives based approach and wrote it in the sense of if needed to comply with the disclosure objectives in the standard, companies need to disclose information that helps users understand things like risk exposures that are not reflected on the balance sheet, for example. And we yeah. put in several illustrative examples of different ways that might look designed to help companies move away from this checklist mentality with things that, that do require that judgment um, and towards focusing on what's important and hopefully having a, a, a well communicated note. Um, one thing I, I would I would definitely add there, if I may, I'm sorry Dave, this is my <laughs> favourite topic. <laughs> um, it's always nice to have an enthusiastic speaker. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, the, the one thing I would add is that, of course, we've had other recently issued new standards, IFRSs 9 and 15, and I don't think I am saying anything out of turn because it's in the public domain to say that you know we have seen examples for a regulators and such saying uh, that disclosures could be improved when mm. they've seen for example the, the first year of implementation of those new standards um, and it's it's interesting for me with my, my dual hat working on the disclosure initiative and also being so, so close to leases that as these new standards have taken steps towards more objectives based approaches 
Personally, I see it as a real opportunity for companies to take those kinds of requirements and really use them to best effect in terms of being able to apply judgment about their entity specific type disclosures and think about what is the best communication for my investors and communicate some really effective, concise information. And taking that opportunity will literally help yeah. you know, me and my team in our other project to m take further steps to help companies move more away from checklists and more toward, towards objectives. So, you know, a, per a personal sort of feeling is that I would love it if in the first year of leases, companies really, really thought about these disclosures, knowing that, that you know, the, the first year is challenging already, but there are side benefits in terms of being able to get systems set up from the first year to gather the information internally for the financial report, and really thinking about the best way to communicate that could have untold benefits in the future. I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Yeah, but as you, as you can sense, I, I love I, this one. I can, I can sense it. And unfortunately, we're, we're beginning to run out of time. But if I, if I could ask you, what's the next steps on that disclosure project? What, what, what do you, what do you see coming next? Well, um, I'll, I'll try my hardest to be concise. So, so the few things that the, that the board are doing specifically, they have already developed what we refer to internally as, as draft guidance for the board, things they will do to, to, yeah. to develop disclosure requirements in, in a way that helps achieve all these things. And they are now testing those plans, if you like, on two test standards. So the two test standards that they've picked are IAS 19, so pension disclosures, and IFRS 13, which is fair value measurement. Okay. And they really have done a rigorous assessment of what can we do? Uh, what can we do here? The, uh, a big focus of the project is about increasing the, the extent to which we understand and well explain investor needs yeah. in the objectives, in the standard, to, to help companies. So we've done loads of outreach with investors on those two standards. We've done outreach with, with companies, auditors and others to, to think about all the practical consequences of the things that investors say would be the dream position. And the board is right now deliberating potential amendments to those two standards, the, the disclosure sections, as a consequence of all of that testing. So in terms of next steps on the project, what we envisage is publishing an exposure draft of amendments to the disclosure requirements of IAS 19 and IFRS 13, but that will be very much accompanied by um, a, a meaty basis for conclusions which will explain all the steps the board has taken to try and do things differently and all the input it needs from stakeholders in terms of how best to move forward and, and allow all stakeholders in the industry to improve the way that financial statements are communicating. So it's going to be a huge piece of, piece of outreach based on yeah. two explicit examples. And then once that's done, presumably it would then be looking at the other standards on a case-by-case -case basis or would there be a disclosure standard that said here are the objectives you should be looking at for all accounting disclosures in, and this kind of overrides the disclosure requirements of others, how, how would it work? Um, at the moment it's far too early for me to say what would happen next because it is absolutely, absolutely critical that we get, so we get input from stakeholders based on these two real examples because un until we have that it would be wrong of me to speculate about what the, the best way so, so for the, anyone listening who is a stakeholder in this and, and uh, is keen to contribute to the, uh, the debate, uh, the ISB will be looking for, for input uh, very yes, shortly. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. Uh, and <laughs> I, I know there will be plenty out there who will do that. So uh, fantastic. Thank, Catherine, thank you very much for coming in and, and uh, updating us on the latest on leases and indeed looking forward to... Uh, a few uh, potential uh, interpretations on leases and indeed the, dis the wide implications of the disclosure project. It's been it's been great having you here. Uh, that's all we've got time for on today's uh, podcast. In the meantime, if you want to further guidance, please do look on uh, PwC Inform or pwc.com forward slash IFRS. But in the meantime, uh, uh, happy accounting. <laughs>
This content is for general information purposes and is not a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.